What's up guys, Rick here with your DFS preview for this week's Northern Trust, the first stop of the FedEx Cup playoff. So we'll talk about what that means. But before we do that, let's look back at the Wyndham Championship. Give a quick shout out to some of the winners from last week. Got a note that some that somebody didn't like this, but hey, I'm, I'm going to keep doing it. DFS and betting is difficult enough. It's nice to get a little bit of a little shout out when you when you do well. So I think it's fair. Uh, so I'll go through these fairly quickly. Uh, Eric Morton, I'll take this ROI every single week, $9 into 100. Tim Forrest won $290. The real Gabagool turned his $6 into 503. Congratulations, that was in the $200,000 birdie. Ryan Lee turned his $13 into 546. Maddie Dukes Hannah won $746. There were actually a few Herman winners. Uh, I don't I don't think I saw anybody who necessarily had him at 500 to one, but some guys got him like Friday night or during the fourth round. So uh, Cody Hooper turns his $3.75 into $562. Uh, Nick Daniel uh, won $750, joining the site a few weeks ago, rickrungood.com with a Herman Winner JT Walters turned his $38 on DraftKings into $704. Uh, Bones Golf, Bones DK Golf won uh, $894. Yahoo Roto Grinder, congrats, won $1,100 on DraftKings. We're getting a little bit higher, getting into the four digits now. Um, Eric Delvin turned his $20 into $1,220. That was a Herman bet. Branning Dukes, I always, or Dykes, excuse me. I always love uh, reading these. First week using the Rick Run Good tools, $367 into $1,400. Gene Kim won $2,000 via the 50K Thursday Stinger. Ecal, Eric Cal Hurricane, won 20 grand. Oh, yeah, on DraftKings. Great finish there. And then an extra special shout out to Joe I. Doan. $112,000. He finished in a tie for second in the big $25 on DraftKings. If you don't know Joe, he was integral in the setup of the DFS Open where we all went down to Florida and played golf and went to the Honda Classic and all that good stuff. Joe was essential. $112,000 on DraftKings last week. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Congratulations, Joe. Hopefully, there's going to be a lot more winners this week as well. Uh, I also have a few winners from the drawings of last week. So winning a month subscription to rickrungood.com and anything they want from the Rick Run Good, the Run Good store. Maybe you want this polo that I'm wearing. Uh, Cody Bishop and Alger Tour. I have already reached out to you. Get in touch with me. I will get you all set up for that. And if you would like to win a month subscription to rickrungood.com. There are two ways to enter. If you're on YouTube, make sure you are subscribed to this YouTube channel, the Rick Run Good YouTube channel. Make sure you like this video. Make sure you hit that notification bell. There is a lot more content these days. Fades, sleepers, betting preview, all this stuff throughout the week. It is timely. You don't want to miss it. Uh, and then leave a comment below with who is going to win this week's Northern Trust. And if you are on Apple I iTunes on the podcast, leave a five-star rating and review for 300 yards to unknown. The Rick Run Good uh, podcast on uh, iTunes. Say something nice about the show. Leave me your Twitter handle. Get in touch. I will link that in the description as well. That's two ways to get you entered into the draw for the prizes. Let's jump into this week's DFS preview for the Northern Trust. All right, we are headed to TPC Boston with the 125 players remaining in the FedEx Cup playoffs. This is the first leg. There are now three legs to the FedEx Cup playoffs. So 
Top 125 this week, there will be a cut. Next week, it is top 70 at the BMW Championship. No cut there. And then the following week, the Tour Championship, top 30 in Eastlake. There is no cut there. And the, the standings, the top 20, 125, 70, and 30 are based on your FedEx Cup standings, not in your finishing position this week. I've already gotten questions about that. It does not matter if you finish in the top 70 of the Northern Trust. It matters if you finish in the top 70 of the FedEx Cup standings if you are going to move on. So the point system continues and, and the points get like quadrupled in the playoffs. They get ramped up in the playoffs here. So uh, keep that in mind. There might be guys who are on the bubble you know, on Saturday and Sunday who might have to take more risks than others. Also, a couple other things. This is being played at TPC Boston. TPC Boston has not hosted, uh, has not been the host of the Northern Trust before, but it was the yearly host to the old first leg of the playoffs, the Dell Technologies Championship, because the FedEx Cup playoffs used to be three, or I'm sorry, used to be four weeks long. Now it is only three TPC Boston got the boot, but now it's back. So it's kind of confusing. I'll show you how we will deal with this on the, uh, on the cheat sheet, but let me show you the key stats. Now, these are the key stats for TPC Boston. It is a par 71. That means there are three par fives. It'll play a hair under 7,300 yards. It is an Arnold Palmer design and it is bent grass. So we are back on on bent. Uh, I have some comparable courses over on the right hand side. Those are other courses that are bent. They're 71 uh, par 71s. Um, you'll, 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 you'll figure it out as we go here. You know, TP, a lot of the TPCs actually Summerlin TPC deer run TPC twin cities all are uh, par 71s with bent grass. Uh, we have some grass specialists here. So th this would be similar to what, two weeks ago when we were, when we were on bent, um, it'll be a smaller, more condensed field now, but a lot of the same names are here. Tom Lewis, Henrik Norlander, Matthew Neesmith, all guys that tend to play better on bent than their original baseline of strokes gain putting, uh, Brooks Kepka also there, although use a little bit of common sense. We'll talk about Brooks. He has not been very good on the greens recently. And then we have the anti-specialists, the guys that are much worse on bent grass than on any other, or than on their, uh, to their normal baseline. I should say those anti-specialists include Wyndham Clark, Robbie Shelton, Harry Higgs, Sun Kang, Alex Norton, Tommy Fleetwood, uh, even Dustin Johnson, much better on other surfaces compared to bent grass. If you like the grass specialties. But let's look at the actual course key stats. And again, if you are new, welcome. You picked a good time. The, the playoffs is always a lot of fun. Um, this is a regression model that does not use. So what it does is it builds player profiles of golfers. And it looks back at attributes that golfers who have had success on TPC Boston have also like what attributes do they share? So. The way to read this is that driving distance was the most important common stat for players who have success at TPC Boston. Uh, only nine other courses was driving distance more important than at TPC Boston. Birdie or better percentage was second. And then strokes gained T to green, strokes gained off the T. So I would argue this is actually uh, much more in line with a normal standard overall week. You know, some weeks we see, oh, strokes gain around the green because there's small greens or strokes gain putting because this turns into a birdie fest or whatever. Um, this, this set of key stats closely aligns with guys who are successful on the PGA Tour. Guys who hit it far, guys who make a lot of birdies, guys who play well from tee to green, guys that hit it well off the tee. Like those are the first four. Uh, and those are the guys that if you just line them up and looked at like career earnings, they would be like the same, the same guys essentially. So the, the cream really does tend to rise to the top at, uh, at the playoff events and at TPC Boston. So guys that we can talk about with those attributes. Well, let's sort by driving distance. Now, this won't be a clear, uh, you know, straight line to the guys who are making the most money, but there's a lot of 
great players here, right? Bryson DeChambeau leads the tour in driving distance. Cam Champ, who's been playing much better, $7,600 is second. Rory McIlroy, uh, 10800 he's third. Then you get a few of the value plays, which is why I like looking at the key stats. It usually does tend to unearth a few of these value plays, which this week in this specific driving distance category would be Sam Burns at 6,900, Jason Kokrak at 68, and then you get Matthew Wolf, $7,800, his game maturing before our eyes. Uh, Bubba Watson, $7,200, so some guys who might be a little bit cheaper who have a very important skill set for this week. Birdie or better, let's go there next. You're going to see some familiar names here. Uh, you know, Bryson DeChambeau not only leads the field in driving distance, he also leads the field in birdie or better percentage. Webb Simpson is second. He is $9,500 this week. He is significantly cheaper than the other elite players on the slate. Justin Thomas, he's your most expensive player. He's 11003 Then you get Terrell Hatton at 8000 He's made a ton of birdies, hasn't played as well in his last couple of weeks. Patrick Cantlay is here. Daniel Berger at $8,900 feels like almost a steal at this point. And then I'll just show you strokes gain T to green so that we have it. And these are going to be your really familiar names, right? You know, your strokes gain T to green players are usually your best players on tour. Uh, Justin Thomas, Hideki Matsuyama, obviously he cannot putt. Colin Morikawa, Roy McIlroy, Xander Shoffley, John Rahm, Bryson DeChambeau. It should be no surprise that these are the best players in the field. I'm not telling you anything secret here, but these are the guys that rank well in strokes gain T to green. Let's jump over to the cheat sheet and figure out what we're going to do with the rest of this field. A couple of things about the cheat sheet. I mentioned that uh, this this course, TPC Boston, has not been used for the Northern Trust before, but it was a staple for the Dell Technologies Championship, uh, which did not happen last year for the first time. It happened in 2018. So what you could actually do on the cheat sheet is change the tournament from the Northern Trust to the Dell Technologies Championship, and this will actually show you course history for TPC Boston. And I've added a few little things for the cheat sheet this week. Uh, you can click on more history. So normally I show you five years of tournament history. You can click on view more history and it will take you to uh, a full 10 years of tournament history if we have it available. So make sure that you are on Dell Technologies Championship over there. So you can see Roy McElroy has won not this event twice. He has won at TPC Boston twice, which, of course, is probably more important than just what the name of the event is. So I'm going to stick with Dell Technologies Championship history for this. And then also, if you noticed it, uh, I also added ranks to the strokes gain number. Sometimes it's a little it's a little abstract to say this guy gained three quarters of a stroke off the tee. Like, where does that rank? So you can actually view this by ranks now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my cheat sheet before I jump into this to be based on rank of strokes gain numbers and also to use Dell Technologies Championship history, which is TPC Boston history. And now I'm ready to rock and roll on this cheat sheet. And I can see that there are six golfers over $10,000 led by Justin Thomas at 11,300. Uh, Hey, there, he's not the number one player in the world anymore. They're, they're, we're gonna be we're gonna be passing this this title back and forth. John Rahm and and JT and Rory and uh, I think Morikawa can actually win this week and be the number one player in the world. I mean, we're gonna pass this title around uh, because there are so many top players. But Justin Thomas, coming off of what is can only be considered a disappointing PGA Championship by his own standards, a 37th place finish. Won just the, the previous start at the WGC Mexico. He won here at TPC Boston in 2017. He is very much deserving of this $11,300 price tag. And I want to show you, I want to show you his strokes gain database here because um, it's it's pretty clear what happens with Justin Thomas. When he doesn't perform, it is always related to the putter. So PGA Championship, he lost 3.5 strokes putting, one of his worst of this season, his third worst event this season, and he still finished 37th. There are a lot of guys who would lose three and a half strokes and they would finish dead last. 
three and a half strokes putting, that is. But if you look at his approach numbers, at his off the tee numbers, his ball striking numbers in general, absolutely sublime almost every single week. The weeks that he does not perform are the weeks that he can not putt. It is that simple. So... Will he putt this week? Well, hard to say. It's one of the most volatile stats, but when the rest of his game is so strong, all he needs to do is putt to essentially tour average. I mean, here's the perfect example of it. Justin Thomas won the WGC FedEx St. Jude losing strokes putting. It's rare. It's very rare. It doesn't happen often. I think it's happened like five or six times in the last calendar year, something like that. Um, Because he was so good from tee to green. He was just so good everywhere else. So it it is possible for him to get it done without putting well. But if that's the only thing that's ever going to be an issue, fire up JT almost all the time. Especially if a lot of owners opt to go with Bryson. I mean, we just talked about it. He's, He's first and off the tee. He's fifth in putting. He's eighth from tee to green. He ranked in every stat. He won at TPC Boston the last time. It, a, a tour event was held there in 2018. Uh, like, there's no reason not to play Bryson. So does everybody flock to Bryson? Does everybody flock to Rory, who I showed you has won twice here? Uh, maybe not, probably because Rory hasn't played well. Rory doesn't have, he has what, one top 25 finish in the restart? Something like that. Uh, and, and it's really for Rory has all come down to the iron game. And I've been kind of keeping an eye on this. I've tweeted this out a couple of times. Um, his irons haven't been good. If you go, so here is the breaking point. Um, Arnold Palmer, the first, so from, let's see, Arnold Palmer back to the beginning of the year, he's gained, he gains like, what is that? 18 strokes on approach total in four measured events in his last six, one, two, three, four, five, six. He's basically been tour average. I mean, it, it, it is, is off the tee game has been great. Uh, his putter has been fine by his own standards, right? He's not a great putter. But the fact that he hasn't hit his irons well has kept him from competing and contending. Now, that's usually a concern because strokes gain approach is usually a statistic that takes longer to make, you know, quick. Tur- it doesn't have quick turns, right? Strokes gain putting round by round, week by week. It's all over the place. Approach isn't really. Uh, it's it's much stickier. So I, I am concerned about Rory, but it leaves him with a, a a really good ownership opportunity, especially if people opt to go to Bryson, opt to go to Dustin, opt to go to Colin Morikawa, for example. I think JT, who is the most expensive, gets a little bit overlooked, and Rory, who is kind of in the sandwich pricing in between a lot of these other good guys, tends to get overlooked at 10800 Let's be real here. You probably can't go wrong with anybody here over 10,000. That is why they are over 10,000. I think a lot of the stands and a lot of the plays start coming from the sub 10K range, right? Because we've got another stacked field top. Only 125 are here. So every, everybody's a big name. I mean, when you start talking about Xander Shoffley at 9,700, what, five straight top 20s. He's the only guy... Uh, you know, at a quick glance here, that ranks in the top, what, 55 of all four major strokes gain categories? I mean, does Bryson? No, Bryson definitely doesn't. Um, I mean, he's just overall solid. So I, I don't know what his ceiling is at the moment uh, because we haven't seen him win as much as we've seen him finish in the top 20, which I know is kind of a weird thing to say because that applies to every single golfer. But uh, I think we could argue he hasn't won as much as his skill set indicates whether it's one bad round, whatever, but, but his floor is very high because he is so good in every stat category. Uh, he rarely plays himself out of an event. He might play himself out of a round, but he rarely plays himself out of a single event. Webb Simpson, unfortunately, um, has as much as I love Webb and, and think he is the most underappreciated golfer, probably on tour. This is not a great, like, there are very specific web courses, right? Wyndham, Sedgefield, obviously. There are very specific places you play web. He has not had a good run at at, uh, at TPC Boston. 49th in 2018, 75th in 2017. He missed the cut here in 2016, 44th in 15. So we're talking the last four years, he does not have a top 40. If we go back a little bit further, let's see what, let's see what happens here. Where's the Webster? 
Here he is. Uh, he did win here. Okay, so he's got further back. It was better. He's got a ninth place finish in 14 and a win in 2011. But that that does not look like a usual web line where it's got two missed cuts. It's got four or five finishes outside the top 40. Uh, was able to snap off a win in 2011. Uh, but I, I'm still not that excited to be to be rostering web. I'd, I'd be more excited uh, to play Jason Day, who has this stretch of golf from 2010 to 2017 where he did not he finished outside the top 25 one time one time and then you look at what he's done recently uh and he's been he's been unbelievable i mean what four straight top seven finishes and i, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago but I'll, I'll refresh it since we didn't see him last week let's go look at his strokes gain numbers his strokes gain database it, it is all one stat that that jason day has fixed uh, and it's the approach game. It's right here. At Rocket Mortgage, he started a run of five straight events in which he has gained strokes on approach. And he's gotten better each and every week up until the PGA Championship where he gains nearly eight strokes on approach. If he improves again, if he goes a, a six straight event improving in this category, he might win the thing. But that's going to be very hard to do. But, but my point being... He's hitting his irons. I mean, look at look at the five or six events before this. He was he was hemorrhaging strokes on approach in only two rounds because he was missing all these cuts. Uh, now he is he flips a switch. Uh, has been playing unbelievably. Still has the great short game. There's something here. He he's found some of this magic that is reminiscent of what he was doing in twenty I don't know 2015, 2016. I'm really starting to think that if you started your lineups uh, with like Jason Day, Daniel Berger, uh, you could be in a really good situation. So since the tours restart, average strokes gain total per round, there is no golfer who has been better than Daniel Berger. Hard stop. 2.27 strokes gained per Per round since the restart, it is better than everyone. Not Bryson, not JT, not Xander. No one, no one on tour has been better than Daniel Berger. Uh, doesn't have great. Let's go back a little bit further for his for his history here. Daniel Berger. Yeah, he's only played at TPC Boston four times. One one twelfth place finish. That was his best. He hasn't missed a cut. I think we can argue he's in the best in the stretch of the uh, his best run of his career. Uh, so might be might be a little bit better this time around. Um, I, I I passed over Berger. I passed over Brooks. Listen, I can't talk about every single one of these guys. Um, if you watch the show, you know that I think Patrick Reed is an absolute big game hunter. Put him in any field, anywhere. He's going to be just fine. I'm concerned about Brooks. He's he's made a lot of quotes recently about the you know maybe mentally being fatigued, physically being fatigued. Uh, he, he this is going to be a seventh straight week of golf. I know he missed the cut last week, but when you play seven straight weeks of golf and you're an elite player, you only do it out of uh, either desperation or necessity. His necessity is getting his game right and getting to East Lake because he's currently outside looking in. He needs a good week this week to get into the BMW Championship. I guess you could say that's the motivation that he needs, but it was the same thing he needed last week and the week before and the week before and the week before. Like it's just I don't know. It's back against the wall Brooks. I guess we're going to see uh, if he can if he can put it all together, uh, especially on the greens, which is where he's been losing just an absolute ton of shots. Now the eighty seven hundred and down range to eight thousands. I'm I'm not as excited to play these guys. I actually think um, before I get to that range, I think Tony Finau is pretty interesting. So I, I understand the fact that he's melted down a couple of times. Um, but four, or sorry, excuse me, three top eight finishes in his last four starts. He finished fourth at TPC Boston. The last time an event was held here. If he doesn't have to win the golf tournament, if he can just finish fourth, that's a great finish for a guy who's $8,800. I like him from a chase position. I'd be a little bit worried if he was the 36 or 54 hole leader, but I like him from a chase position. Certainly, uh, the, the 8,700, which is where tiger starts down to 8,000. Terrell Hatton and Justin Rose. I, I'm not particularly thrilled to play any of these guys. I think they all have flaws. Tiger 8700 will always carry more ownership than he probably should. Um, actually, I want to switch back to the ranks here. 
he will always carry more ownership than he probably should. And he, he just can't putt right now. He cannot putt. That is the, the one thing holding him back. I can show you the stats here uh, for Tiger, but he's just been really bad on the greens. And he's been grinding super hard to make cuts at both the PGA Championship and the Memorial. But even if you go back to Genesis, I mean, this is three straight tournaments. He's lost strokes on the greens. His approach game looks good. I mean, the rest of his game's pretty solid at the moment. He's got to figure out the putter. Will he do it this week? I don't know. Um, I will probably not have as much Tiger Woods as everyone else just because he's always over-owned and um, I, have, I haven't seen enough. I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope he goes out and wins the thing. You know, there's also some flaws with some of these guys like, you know, Hideki can't putt. We know that, right? I mean, it's funny to look at the ranks. It's funny to look at the ranks for both him and Paul Casey, who are just absolutely awesome off the tee on approach. And then they're outside the top 190 in putting, uh, which is absolutely crazy. Although we have seen Paul Casey be better, right? The runner-up finish at the PGA Championship to Colin Morikawa, then a 31st at the Wyndham. I would actually like to see... How many strokes um, he gained putting last week or lost, I guess, and see what his numbers were. So let's look up Casey here together. Uh, okay, so this is exactly what you want to see from Paul Casey. You want to see him be right here. So at the PGA Championship, he gained less than one stroke putting, and he gained one and a half at Wyndham. That's all you need. You don't need him to go nuts. You want him to be field average. Now, Shockingly, at Wyndham, his irons weren't that good. He lost strokes on approach the first time he's lost since Pebble Beach in that category. Pretty shocking stuff. Um, so I, I, I'm hoping we can get a bounce back situation there from Paul Casey. I'm, I'm more optimistic to play him, certainly, than I am to play Hideki Matsuyama, especially because Casey, uh, TPC Boston's been a good spot for him. Last three years, 21st, 4th, and 2nd. Um, Hideki's got some good finishes, too. He's been piling up. Up, piling up top 25s here. I just don't trust the guy, and I don't trust the putter. Hope I'm wrong again. Uh, then you get Tommy Fleetwood who goes out, shoots you know one of the worst rounds of the day on Sunday, falls to 59th at Wyndham. Uh, really wasn't good there on Sunday. Hovland, who has come a, a bit back down to earth, coming uh, coming from a week off. We'll see how he'll be able to react to his first uh, career playoff event. Same thing for Scotty Scheffler. He's got his first career playoff event here, but he's piled up three straight top 22 finishes. So there's, there's guys down here. Um, I was a big fade on, on Justin Rose last week. Um, we're going to pull him up and take a deeper look at him real quick because, uh, he goes out and misses the cut, which, uh, I mean, was great for me, but let's see how he did it. Yeah. So that putting obviously comes back down to earth, right? So the, the big reason for the fade was, seven strokes gained putting at the PGA championship. That was not going to be something he replicates. And he didn't, he gained uh, 0.8 strokes over two rounds. The rest of his game all over the place. Couldn't find it with the driver. Couldn't find it with the irons. Um, he has been very much, uh, uh, what is it? Jekyll or Hyde <laughs> it, since the restart. And, and really the first two events were really his only awesome events. Right, he missed the he missed the, the playoff at Charles Schwab by a shot. Played well at the RBC Heritage. Then he missed three straight cuts and was terrible. Then he was like not that good at the PGA Championship and a hot putter takes him to a top ten. And then he wasn't that good at Wyndham. So I could argue he's had five straight weeks where he like hasn't profiled very well. I know he has a top ten in there, but five straight weeks he has not profiled very well. That is a concern for sure. Incredibly interested to see what Billy Horschel can do because Billy Horschel has been playing well, um, played awesome at Wyndham last week. This is Billy Horschel's season. We know he's won multiple playoff events before he's won the FedEx Cup. However, TPC Boston, uh, that's been a bugaboo. Three straight years, he hasn't made the cut. If you go back four years, he still doesn't have anything in the top 70. So not a good run for Billy. Interested to see what owners do with him uh then you start getting down into like, like i think matthew wolf is pretty interesting here you know he can let it fly with the driver we saw that that his his skill set um should le should lend well to tpc boston and also his game is just maturing so much right now i i really like the way his game is rounding into form he has now four top 22 finishes in his last six starts remember it took him like 
how like after he won, he went basically an entire year without another top 10. His game is much more mature now, and I think will continue to get more mature. Uh, Sung J M, I think, is arguably, and I'm not even sure you could argue this, um, the 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 most underpriced guy here or most mispriced guy. I mean, he's seventy seven hundred dollars. He played like the Sung J M that we know and love last week at the Wyndham. Just goes absolutely bonkers on the weekend. What did he end up shooting on the or not even on the weekend? The final three rounds. Yeah, he goes 64, 66, 65 in the final three rounds. Uh, that's the Sung Jay that I know. Put him in any field, put him on any course, he'll be just fine. 7,700, absolute steal. Um, Kevin Kisner, I kind of feel the same about. Not not as strongly, obviously, but uh, he's in the midst of a really good stretch right now. Three straight top 25s, including the third place last week at the Wyndham. Uh, we know he can put the lights out. He'll hit enough fairways. Really like the way that he profiles uh, for Boston. And then now we're down in this kind of awkward 7000 low $7,000 range. Um, Doc is here. Doc is $7,400, third place at the Wyndham. Hit the ball super well. Let's see... If I can find his strokes gain numbers real quick. Yeah, look at these ball striking numbers. Gained 9.2 strokes between off the tee and approach. That's your ball striking. Uh, that was third in the field at the Wyndham Championship. So Jim Herman was first. He won the golf tournament. Siwoo Kim was second. Uh, he basically almost made three aces on Saturday. And the guy was absolutely lights out with his irons. Doc Redman was third. That's the quiet part that we're not talking about. Doc Redman, third in the ball striking category. Now the third time in his last seven starts that he has gained at least nine strokes ball striking. I am not going to look, but I would, I would argue that's probably the most in the restart. I knew as soon as I said that, I was going to have to look this up. So here we go. Since the restart. Guys who have gained nine strokes of ball striking in a single event. Bryson has done it twice. Justin Thomas has done it twice. Victor Hovland has done it twice. Tony Finau has done it twice. Those are the only guys that have done it multiple times. Doc Redman has done it three times. He is a ceiling ball striker. It's unbelievable. He flushes it. It's great. Um, Mark Immelman, who joins us on the First Cut Pod on CBS Sports, followed the Horschel Redman group on Sunday at the Wyndham and was just raving about how how Doc flushes it and how what a heavy ball he hits and how how great he is uh, ball striking it and the numbers absolutely back it up. All right, now we're starting to get down into the bottom parts of the sevens. What are we going to do down here? Benny on back in the field this week. He's 7,300. He's got back-to-back top 25s. He's finished 30, he finished 31st at TPC Boston in his only trip two years ago. Russell Henley, uh, I'm never really a big Russell Henley guy. I know he finished ninth last week. I know he's a great iron player. I, I, I never really get there on on Henley, but I, I couldn't I couldn't kill you for it. Um who else? Oh, uh, Fratelli. Here, here's a guy that I think I've said for like three or four straight weeks now. Hey, what about Dylan Fratelli? Um, you know, the, the fact that he had to WD when he tested positive for COVID, it actually makes his recent results look worse than they are. If you look at his strokes gain numbers, if you look at what he's actually doing, T to green, he's been awesome. Four straight top 35 finishes, including three top 25s. Hasn't missed a cut since the work day. Um, seven thousand dollars for Fratelli. He's probably one of the the hotter guys down in this range here. Man, Lucas Glover's really burned us three three missed cuts in a row. That's pretty shocking. Um, Kevin Na is here. I, I feel like I say this a lot about Kevin Na. Uh, feast or famine. If you want a highly volatile golfer at sixty eight hundred dollars who is capable of winning a golf tournament, but also very capable of missing the cut, Kevin Na is your guy. Here's here's his res- last five results. Fifth, WD. Ninth, 35th, and a missed cut. It's, it's basically a top 10 or a missed cut. Uh, here's his last two starts at TPC Boston. Missed cut, sixth. There you go. Top 10 or missed cut. He is going to be all over the place. Uh, but if that is what you were looking for, 
I couldn't blame you for playing Kevin Not. Who else? Uh, Zach Johnson I want to look at because I feel like he's been a bit of fool's gold, although I think his, his Wyndham was probably better than I'm giving him credit for here. Yeah, he was dynamite on a pro- see that that is the Zach Johnson we kind of no, have come to expect here, uh, not the one from the PGA Championship where he jumps out to like four under and he's one of the best players after round one, uh, all through putting and then he gives it away. Uh, this what we saw last week from Zach Johnson, much more in line with with the normal Zach Johnson. I still probably won't get there on him because I have a feeling that there's going to be some congregation of ownership on him at sixty eight hundred dollars. Lonto. He's sub 7K. You know what that means. Probably fire him right back up. He seems to get you at least 10 times value every single time and probably much better than the rest of his peers here. Uh, But there's even some pretty decent names. I mean, Adam Long at 66, he's been playing fine. Denny McCarthy, 67. We're not getting a ton of terrible names here until you start to get to, I don't know. I probably wouldn't play anybody at 60 four or lower um i'm trying to see if there's anybody here who might even be i mean there's just a lot of missed cuts what what this ends up being is a lot of guys who secured their spot early in the season sebastian munoz is a perfect example of this he's the dead man um kind of secured his spot by winning in the swing season then we miss a bunch of events in the middle of the year he's here because he's still able to qualify for the top 125 um played absolutely horrible on the weekend uh, last week, but yeah, that, that's, that's what you're seeing down here in the bottom of this, of this pricing pool. Let's make a real quick custom model and then we'll get out of here. Um, so here we go. Custom model, rickrungood.com, uh, pretty standard stats this week. So I'm going to keep it pretty standard. I'm going to go 65 of my weights on strokes gain T to green. I'm going to do 25 on birdie or better. It leaves me with 10. I'm going to put them on distance. Those were the three key stats for this week. I don't know if I've allocated the right numbers to them, but we're going to see what this what this shows us. And yeah, I think I think this is going to be no surprise. Um, the big name players show up at the top, right? I mean, Rory and Bryson are my one and one A. They're literally tied. And then Justin Thomas, Hideki Matsuyama, Xander Shoffley, John Rahm, Tony Fee. Now there are really no surprises here, and I think this is indicative of what we're going to see this week. There are plenty of good golfers. There are a ton of guys that are going to be considered good plays. It is just going to be a matter of how you fit them all into a lineup. I feel like lineup construction is going to be more important this week than actual. Is this guy a play? Is this guy a fade? Whatever. Like lineup construction is probably going to be much more important. And I think you're seeing that with some of the big names, some of the models that uh, you could potentially run here because you're going to get so many big name players. You can't fit three guys over $10,000 in your lineup. How are you going to do it? So lineup construction feels like it's going to be critical this week. All right, that's it. Welcome to the playoffs. We got a stretch run, a sprint to the finish line of the FedEx Cup, and then we will kick this next season off right away. Uh, there is no break, so it should be a lot of fun. Let me know what you think. Tweet me at Rick Run Good. Leave a comment below. Talk to you guys soon. Best of luck this week.